Raj Salakurnikov, uh, Raj got his PhD from uh, Toronto and then was a postdoc at MIT and faculty at Toronto and now faculty at CMU and also uh, director of research at Apple. And uh, really looking forward to this talk. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks, uh, thanks for uh, uh, inviting me. So I, I'm, I guess I'm speaking for the full day today, so you'll, you'll, you'll get tired of me. So what I was, was, was going to try to do through this tutorial is I'll try to give you a little bit of a background on, um, uh, on the deep learning and also look at some of the early papers and also try to motivate uh, a few things from uh, a little bit theory, because I know that's a theory crowd. So it's going to be a mix of theory and practical tricks. And I'll show you a few hacks uh, where we in the uh, deep learning community know that these are hacks, but maybe there is a good theory behind th those hacks. Um, so let me just point out that uh, uh, quickly that uh, uh, one of the big um, uh, advances in deep learning uh, that we've seen in the last few years is really due to the data, right? The large quantities, large availability of data. And the truth is lots of successful approaches so far, the ones that I'm going to show you, uh, are really dependent on having lots and lots of data. Uh, so these algorithms are very data hungry. Um, and uh, one way of viewing these models, these deep learning models, you can think of them as hierarchical models. Models that support inference as well as discover structure at multiple levels of representation. And as I go through the uh, tutorial, I'll try to make it uh, a little bit more precise of, of, of what I mean here. The impact has been quite strong. Um, in some cases, it was also surprising even to uh, folks in, uh, uh, in the computer vision community. So in the computer vision community, I'm going to show you some examples. That's now is a dominant technique uh, to use. And even we who were looking at these models before really didn't think they would, they would be able to work so well. Um, the other uh, area where there is a lot of work right now is language understanding, or natural language processing. And that's, that's the area that uh, uh, there is a lot of room for improvement in that space. And I'll say a few words about that as well. And even in places like drug discovery and medical image analysis, we see uh, approaches popping up in that space as well, which is very, very important. Um, here's one example. Let me just show you a few examples uh, before we get into the uh, details. Uh, this is a, a model. Uh, it's a hierarchical model. You have multiple layers of uh, uh, neurons. And if you build this model uh, based on bag of words representation, just a simple word counts of, of what you see on the web page, or uh, in this case, it was news stories from Reuters data set, and you look at the 2D embedding of those words, that's the kind of structure that you are discovering. Right? So this is completely unsupervised. You don't need labeled examples. This is just what comes out of building, building these models. Um, and it's sort of nice because it finds these different classes just based on word co-occurrence and, 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 and relationship between the words. I always like to joke that if you look at European community economic policies, these are documents or web pages about those, and, and these are disasters and accidents. Okay. So there is some uh, <laughs> uh, overlap uh, between the two. Um, uh, yes, sorry. Can you, uh, is, is the mic on? Okay, sorry. Um, it, it shows that it's on. Uh, yes, but I'll, I'll, I'll speak up. Here's, um, uh, here's another example, uh, which is very kind of important examples in computer vision. I give you that image and I can tag it, right? So that's in practical applications, that's important. Um, how many of you know who that is? No? So this is uh, Antonio Teralba. He's a professor at MIT. He's a computer vision professor. Uh, and there's a picture that I took of him back in, uh, at the NIPS conference. Right, so you can tag it. Um, uh, but let's say uh, you want to go beyond that and you want to generate a caption. You want to generate a description of what you see in that image. Um, and that's generally a very hard problem. So one way of doing it would be to say, well, I can find, maybe I can find a similar image in my database, in my training set, and just copy the caption. Right? That's one way of doing it. And that's what you get. Um, so the nearest neighbor sentence, people taking pictures of a crazy person. Uh, but if you actually build a stochastic model uh, based on so-called so neural language models, you can uh, uh, get a distribution of possible sentences. And these are just a few samples from, um, uh, from uh, something called neural language model. I'm going to talk about that uh, later during tutorial. And it does do reasonably well. Right? In the last couple of years, um, 
uh, there's been a few papers and people are showing reasonable results. These are not perfect, but they actually look reasonably well, which was surprising to a lot of us in the community that they would work that well. Um, uh, and these are just some examples of uh, these systems. These are sort of hand-picked examples, but they work quite well. Uh, in many cases, they do, like, like if you look at that image, it says a, a car is parked in the middle of nowhere. That's just, that's just really good. And, uh, but I'm, I'm going to show you some caveats as, as I go through the tutorial. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend this hour focusing on supervised learning, because I think that these are um, uh, deep networks for supervised learning. I think these are the most successful models as of today. Um, right, they work remarkably well, and I'd like to just show you some of, uh, some of the definitions, but I'd like to also show you some of the recent optimization and regularization techniques uh, that, that work in practice, but perhaps lacking in theory. Um, so, uh, sorry, and then the last part of the tutorial, I will really focus on unsupervised learning and learning generative models, because I think that that's actually a uh, um, very uh, important area. Um, and from practical standpoint, these models don't work as well as these models. So it's always unsupervised learning is much harder problem than supervised. Um, and the last part, I'm just going to show you some, some of the open, open questions that people are trying to solve today. OK, just a little bit of motivation so that we're on the same page. Imagine that I have this image. I take pixel representation. And just based on the pixel space, I'm trying to separate and figure out, is this a segue or not a segue, right? On the other hand, if I find the right feature representation, I find the right, uh, uh, for example, I can find a hand, a window, a part-based representation, then I can maybe, I might have a chance of solving that problem, right? So in, 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 in practice, a lot of people are figuring out what, is, um, what kind of representations to use. So it's all representation learning. Um, and so if you look at traditional approaches, typically you would have a data, you construct some features, <laughs> you run your learning algorithm, right? That's uh, like in vision, for example, on in speech, you find some low-level vision, you find some audio features, and then you are uh, running your favorite learning algorithm, like an SVM or decision tree and, and, and such. So if you look at the space of vision, in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of different techniques for finding the right features, uh, right? And if you look at the vision community 10 years ago, Everything was about how do I construct the right features? If I'm competing on some challenging tasks, recognition tasks, I have this feature representation versus this feature representation. Um, if you look at the space of uh, audio, same thing is happening. People are trying to figure out what's the right representation. So in, in the last few years, um, this idea of representation learning, can we actually figure out what the, the representations are based on the data? Uh, or based on, uh, uh, let's say, an image is based on pixels. In language, is based on words. Can you find the right uh, representations? So it's a little bit uh, ambitious, because in machine learning, we typically put our machine learning hats, and we say, if we have enough data, we can figure out what they are. And then you know, other communities say, well, that's, that's not possible. So there's a lot of papers right now written on end-to-end -end learning, and it still is a debate when we incorporate prior knowledge, when we can learn these things from data. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to just give you a little bit intro into the basic neural nets. Uh, and I'm going, to borrowing, I'm going to be borrowing some slides from Hugo LaRochelle. Uh, he has an excellent tutorial, if you're interested in um, uh, uh, the deep learning tutorial, and sort of goes very um, uh, through all the details behind these models. So he's put a lot of work in, into that. I'm going to borrow some of, uh, some of his slides. So just very quickly, I'd like to briefly go over the definition of neural networks, how to train neural networks, and focus more on these recent techniques that actually are quite successful. Uh, and I think that that's where we're lacking theory. So I'm hoping that uh, um, some of you might, might be able to uh, uh, give a little bit of a justification why these systems are working so well. So artificial neuron, very basic. You have an input, you, take linear uh, you have a linear combination of the inputs, right? So that's uh, a neuron pre-activation. You have a neuron uh, uh, output activation, so you pass this uh, 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 linear combination through some nonlinear function G, right? And you have these Ws, typically these are called weights in the model. Uh, in, the neuro in, in your neural network, B is the bias term, and G is called the activation function. And people are sort of exploring different activation functions, right? So very, very standard. 
Um, and you can think of it as, uh, you know, if you have the output of uh, activation of the neuron, the bias here only changes the position of the rift, and the range of the rift is determined by the nonlinearity. Okay? So that's a very simple uh, uh, job of a single neuron. Some activations functions, some of the popular activation functions, just quickly, there's a sigmoids, right? And what it does is just squashes the neuron's output between zero and one. It's always positive, bounded, it's strictly in increasing. Uh, there's another counter part, uh, part called 10H uh, activation. Uh, but I'd like to point out one of the um, uh, most successful ones um, that, again, was uh, originally developed by Jeff Hinton um, is the rectified linear activation function. Uh, so these are the most uh, used in practice right now. So it's bounded below by zero. It's always non-negative. Um, and it tends to produce sparse activities. Because you know, if your output of a neuron is, is negative, you basically shut it down. Right? And it also has nice properties that you know, the gradient has linear, um, because it's a linear function. If it's non-zero, it can, it, it's, it's, uh, you can backpropagate uh, through. And it's also optimization-wise, it's a little bit easy to optimize. Uh, these uh, neural networks using these real activation functions. There is still a little bit of debate whether is this nonlinearity better than sigmoid nonlinearity? And uh, there is a debate uh, whether one is better than the other, whether one learns better representations than the other, but it turns out in terms of optimization, it's much f easier to optimize uh, these ones. Is it understood why it is easier? I is think it's, it's so, uh, I think it's because you basically, if you think about the path from the input to the output, it's linear, right? And the whole system becomes nonlinear. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry, is, it, is this better? Okay. The only way, um, the only reason why the system becomes nonlinear is because you shut down some paths, uh, right? The other thing, practically speaking, is uh, whenever you compute sigmoid or 10h. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time on, on your computer, whereas if it's a linear, it's just a linear operation. So just practically speaking, people tend to use these activation functions. Um, now, let, let's look at the uh, uh, single layer neural nets. It's very standard. You have your input, you have a hidden activation function, and then you have an output acti activation function, right? <coughs> you can think of output activation function, let's say if it's a softmax output, if you're trying to uh, do classification, um, or it's a Bernoulli, trying to do a binary classification, or it's just a linear function if you're trying to do regression. In a multi-layer neural network, you just have multiple layers, uh, right? So you have an input, it goes through nonlinearity, L times, if you have L hidden units, and then there's an output, right? So the entire system you can think of as just layers of neurons, layers of these nonlinear activations, and then you have uh, an output. So it's a deterministic function. So for now, we, we, we we're talking about just deterministic uh, uh, functions. There is no stochasticity. Um, and in terms of the capacity of the neural uh, net, you know, the way to think about this is that every single neuron just gives you a linear uh, uh, piece here. But if you combine them together, you can actually construct fairly complex decision boundaries. Right? So you know, even in the, uh, in the case of a single <coughs> neural network, in principle, your, your space you can, you can design fairly complex nonlinear decision boundaries, right? So this would be belonging to class two, class two, and this is class one and class one, right? because of nonlinearities. Um, and uh, just to point out, there is this universal approximation theorem that essentially saying that a single hidden layer neural network with a linear output can approximate pretty much any continuous function. Right. So that result, that result I mean, it, it sort of says that if I have uh, close to infinite number of hidden variable, hidden neurons, then I can just do a little linear piecewise approximation so I can approximate anything I want. So that's sort of, um, uh, it's good, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't really mean that there is a learning algorithm that can find the parameter values for your function that you're trying to approximate. Um, so let me just uh, uh, point out one thing. Um, there is also, in our community, I'll show you later that People are finding that if you have multiple layers of these nonlinear activation functions for a lot of practical problems, you get strong results. You get good generalization results. But there isn't good theory behind you know, when this might happen, for what class of functions it, it, it might be true. Uh, right? So there is a, uh, because you know, this universal approximation does tell you that with a single layer, you can, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, 
So let me just uh, point out a couple of things <laughs> that you need to specify. You need to specify a loss function, and then there's a backpropagation algorithm, uh, which is a gradient descent algorithm for training these models. And typically, for a lot of uh, problems in supervised learning, that's a standard. You have empirical risk minimization. You have to define the loss function. There is a regularizer. Learning is cast as an optimization problem. Um, right? So for example, for classification problems, we'd like to optimize classification error. But in a lot of cases, we're looking at um, uh, a surrogate for what, what, what we want to optimize. So from that perspective, you know, when I talk to theory folks, there is no difference. It's a supervised learning problem. You have an objective you're trying to optimize. You have a regularizer. And it turns out for neural nets, this piece, the regularizer piece, as I'm going to show you later, plays a really, really critical role. Um, and I think that it's because of the recent techniques, regularization techniques, um, is what made these models actually uh, so, uh, so successful. Um, one of, uh, uh, yes? So like 10 or 15 years ago, people were not using regularization? People yeah. were using regularization, but they would, they would be using regularizations like L2 regularization, for example. Okay. Uh, but these ones were not, I mean, they work, but they're not sufficient. Uh, like there are other techniques, like dropout, for example, that really is, uh, allows you to. Um, but that's a dropout better. only affects by a couple percent or something. No, I think that in a lot of practical problems, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that point. Yeah, yeah. There is, there is another, there is another uh, I guess, piece that plays, plays a role when I, when I talk about dropouts. But uh, I'm going to talk about dropouts, yeah. Um, so stochastic gradient descent, you're training these models using stochastic gradient descent. Uh, you initialize your parameters, you run through, uh, taking derivative of your loss function, your gradients, and you update the model parameters. Right? And one other piece that I want to mention here is that stochastic gradient descent, um, plus some uh, whistles to it, um, is actually working surprisingly well. Uh, generally speaking, it's very hard to beat stochastic gradient descent with a few tricks. Uh, um, so to train a neural network, you need to specify a loss function. You need this procedure for computing the gradient of the loss function. And you need the regularizer and the gradient of the regularizer. Right? So these are three things. Once you have the whole system is deterministic, you can do stochastic gradient descent. Uh, I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time talking about how we compute the gradients of the loss function. But there is a backpropagation algorithm. It's a very standard. It's just a chain rule. Um, uh, and it's, if you think about the whole computational flow graph for these models, is you have a forward propagation, which you can think of it as a cyclic flow graph. Uh, so given the input, you compute uh, the linear combination, you pass it through nonlinearity, and you do it with multiple, multiple levels. So there's a forward pass. And there are packages, if you're interested, there's a lot of work on um, uh, optimization tools and such that allow you to do these things very efficiently on GPUs, spreading it across multiple GPUs. If you look at packages like TensorFlow, Torch, these are very, um, um, yes? When you say stochastic gradient descent works very well, do you mean it finds the global optima or just finds a very good? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that point. Yeah, so one thing I, I guess I should point uh, is that with these models, um, uh, there are sort of, um, we can't find global optimum. There are lots and lots of local optimum. Uh, right? And then I, as I go through this talk, I think that's one uh, interesting thing to, to explore because um, seven, eight years ago, there was always a debate of you're training these models. These are, these are, you, you can't solve an optimization problem. Um, so you're always going to get stuck at a local optimum. Right? So it's, and, and you can't prove anything about uh, these, uh, the convergence of these algorithms. And so there were sort of optimization folks and, and, uh, who would say, this is, this is impossible. And then there are people who sort of don't, I guess, didn't know much about optimization. I guess when I was in grad school, I didn't really care with, or at least maybe folks in my group didn't really care whether it was convex or non-convex. Um, and then it turns out that uh, just in practice, we don't see local optimum as a big problem. It just doesn't happen. And there are a few recent papers showing that why that might be. But that's also a very good research question, very good uh, theory question to figure out why that is happening. We train these models, there are tons of local optimum, but it's not like I train my model 100 times, one out of 100 times I get really good solution, the rest of the time I get really, really bad solution. Right? That just doesn't happen. Um, and then the computational from, for, uh, for the backpropagation method, you can think of it, you're taking the, the, the gradients of the error, you're backpropagating it back. 
And there's something that's called uh, backprop method, which is again computes the gradient to back to your loss function. One thing I also want to point out, as I mentioned, there are software packages that allow you to do that, and it's fairly efficient and, and, and so forth. So you don't really need to uh, code this up yourself. Uh, model selection fairly quickly. You train your model and training set. You do uh, you 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 typically search over the hyperparameters in your validation set, and you estimate generalization performance on the test set. Uh, one thing I also want to point out, there's a lot of research on the hyperparameter search. Uh, this is right now done uh, manually, typically. There are a few techniques like random search, or Bayesian optimization, uh, sorry, and such, but... What selection you mean? Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, so uh, good point. So what are these hyperparameters? Okay. Um, hyperparameters in these models are uh, you know, what's number your, yeah, what a number of layers, uh, how many convolutional filters you want to use, uh, what's the learning rate. So there's a lot of different uh, hyperparameters, and it's, and in many cases, they do play pretty critical role um, to find sort of uh, the best architecture. There's also kind of a joke happening in our community where it says that in the vision and speech communities 10 years ago, we were looking how to figure out what the features are. And now we're kind of figuring out what the architectures are. So we t we're tweaking features, now we're tweaking architectures. So, um, which, is, which is a little bit better in my view. Um, and one technique that's actually working fairly well is the early stopping. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's one thing that I just wanted to point out. Um, let me also point out that a lot of uh, times when you're optimizing these models, uh, we're using mini batches instead of a single example, right? Uh, yes, question. This is this is this is kind of a standard. I just wanted to, uh, yeah. Question. Earlier, you stated the um, universality theorem that every function can be approximated by a single layer. Is that the theorem doesn't come with a with an algorithm that finds that? But if you um, apply some of the best algorithms for deep networks to to find a, just a single hidden layer representation of a function that you do know as a single layer representation. Does it tend to work? Or actually, does algorithms work, work better for deep representation? Uh, let, me, let me get to this question. Let me get to the question, because I think that uh, uh, it's a very good question. But uh, uh, towards the end, uh, can you remind me precisely of that question? And then I'll, 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 I'll say a few words about that for sure. Can, can I say one sentence? Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, as a theorist, of course, I've done these experiments too, uh, and my students. So, yeah, you can generate data using one hidden layer with whatever number of hidden units. But then, if you try to train it with the best algorithms, it needs more units. Yeah. There is, so yes. You have to overparameterize, and then it works. So that's that's actually what one of the good, uh, points that I want to m mention later is, as I go through the regularization techniques is that we do find uh, for uh, a lot of cases, even for recurrent networks or for these deep networks, is that even if you, gener you, generate, a data, you generate data from a single a layer neural net, or if you generate a data that has latent space of one dimension, you know, we know that there is a one latent unit that generates the data, but optimization still becomes a hard problem. So you have to overparameterize typically. You know, if instead of one, you have six hidden units, um, you can find uh, that function. You sort of you, you always have to expand the space. It turns out that optimization is just much easier in an overparameterized space. Um, but but I'll, I'll I'll talk about this. Um, the other thing is uh, I, I also want to point out this is again just the practical pieces. Momentum plays a very important role, so it's an exponential average of the previous gradients. Um, right, so this is actually uh, one of the techniques that works surprisingly well. Uh, so when you write papers and you see somebody just using stochastic gradient descent without momentum um, to compare their algorithm against uh, SGD, that always becomes a little bit suspicious because they should be using, or at least using the, uh, the momentum. And momentum means uh, uh, no, size of mini batches. <coughs> you know, momentum here means just the exponential average of the previous gradients. Right, because in many cases, when you're using mini batches, stochastic gradient descent, you know, one point, the gradient can point out this way, okay, so this way, average, average of the previous gradients, because it kind of gives you, uh, you know, it's almost like in a poor man's approximation to uh, you know, diagonals of the Hessian. Is it clear uh, how to choose the beta here? No. That's another hyperparameter. 
So you will see lots of hyperparameters sitting in, this, in these models. That's one of, um, uh, you know, to some extent, it's one of the drawbacks for these systems, but at the same time, it's also one of the powers, you know, because if you find the right configuration, these models work surprisingly well, uh, far better than. Um, uh, so let me actually uh, focus a little bit more on um, um, the reason techniques, because I think these are um, fairly important for, for training these models. Um, so one of, one of the key components of, of these models is that you're learning so-called distributed representations. Uh, right, so you have multi-layer fit forward networks, um, or uh, later on throughout tutorials, we're gonna talk about multi-layer graphical models like deep belief networks, Boltzmann machines. Um, and you can think of every single layer as learning distributed representations. So every single um, latent variable or unit um, is, is not mutually exclusive, right? So every single uh, unit is a separate feature in the input, and two units can be active at the same time. Um, and units ne don't necessarily correspond to the partitioning of the data. Uh, right? so it's unlike in clustering. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, this is coming from Joshua's um, uh, book on uh, foundation strands and machine learning. You know, if you look at clustering or nearest neighbor type of approaches, you typically partition the space and you find prototypes in one way or another. Um, right. So the number of parameters are roughly, uh, you have to sort of specify number of parameters for each region and the number of parameters is linear, with, uh, so the number of regions is linear in the number of parameters. Uh, for um, these uh, distributed uh, systems, systems that want distributed representations like both machines, Factograph, PCA, sparse coding, these are very popular uh, models. Um, uh, you basically have, you know, just intuition uh, wise, you, you have an input, you're partitioning the space. You have another feature, partitions uh, the space. Oh, sorry, whoa. Um, right, if you have another input, you partition the space. So you can see that every single uh, last neuron. Thing, last thing to feel. Yes. This is the recurrent mistake of Joshua. He doesn't understand the theory. I mean, it is not growing exponentially. There is a theory of the number of realizable uh, assignment, uh, sign assignment. There's old papers of Noga alone that shows that it grows sure. polynomially and not exponentially. Oh, it goes polynomially. It okay, goes polynomial. polynomial. Okay, yeah, Wait, I agree with you. The, um, number the number of parameters that affect if, if, if regions <laughs> roughly grow grows exp uh, not exponential but polynomially. That's the number of the number of cells you can generate. The number of regions that you can generate. Uh, as you add more and more half spaces, the number of different regions that you can generate grows polynomially in the number of of. Uh, uh, hyperplanes, and not exponentially in the number of hyperplanes. No, it this depends is on the dimension. Yeah. It, it depends on the dimension. Well, yeah. No, no, it, uh, it depends on the dimension, sure. The dimension is it's exponential yeah. dimension, but polynomial in the number of, of... No, but the exponential dimension is important. Yeah, but it's not what is, what is discussed here. It's like each time you add the unit, how does it affect the number of no, regions? This is just for illustration, the planar diagram, right? I mean, it's in high dimension. You, <coughs> the dimension is fixed. Each time you, you it's just for it exponential in the number. Right, right, right. I, I think it's exponential. I don't. I don't okay, know. I'll, I'll show it's it. it's still, but but uh, yeah, we can we can we, we can de uh, we can have debate. But the, the point that. Uh, uh, <laughs> I guess to, to uh, it's true, so, um, but uh, the point is that it's very different. What I wanted to emphasize here is that it's quite different from um, you know, partitioning-based methods, right? Like uh, mixture models, for example. Uh, it, it comes, it sometimes has advantages, it, it's advantageous, but sometimes it's also disadvantageous. You know, in some cases, you might wanna be able to just take one partition of the space and, and say something about it. Uh, so there's some examples where, uh, this might not be the right thing to do. Um, there is also a little bit of inspiration from visual cortex. Uh, I wanted to show this for some of you uh, where you know, there, is, there is a little bit of inspiration from uh, deep learning community coming from neuroscience. And there's a work by G uh, Jim DiCarlo at MIT who kind of looks at the visual systems and neuroscience if you're interested, uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, so let me get to a little bit more controversial things um, that I wanted to bring here. Uh, is the notion of why training is hard, okay? And it's, it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit of an uh, um, interesting, interesting debate. So one hypothesis is it's a very hard optimization problem, right? Uh, 
Um, we all know that whenever we're using sigmoid or 10H nonlinearities, there's a vanishing gradient problem because when you propagate the gradients, you, they, these go through these squashing functions, and as you know, the gradients tend to vanish. And that's a very well-known problem, it's particularly in recurrent networks where you have many, many layers. Um, saturated units can block the gradients. So you know, uh, a few years, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people thought that it's just a hard optimization problem. You're trying to optimize it. If you have five layers, seven layers, you just can't do it. It's just the gradients get blocked and, and you get stuck. Um, so that's, that's one. Uh, the second hypothesis is kind of alternative, is to say maybe there is overfitting happening. Because um, you're looking at the space of these complicated functions. You have multiple nonlinearities, these very no, uh, nonlinear systems. You have lots of parameters. So you might actually be in high variance, low bias regime. Right, so you just, and that's true, actually, in many cases, we do overfit, we do see overfitting. Um, uh, right, so it's kind of two things that people uh, uh, thought about. Sorry, and could you explain what you mean by low variance, high, uh, high variance, low bias? So uh, there is a, uh, I, I guess I should have put the slide on uh, bias variance decomposition, right? So any error, generalization error, has two components to it, three components. There is uh, bias squared, the variance, and plus the noise, right? So you can think of it as basically saying that if I have a linear function, a linear function will have low bias because if I train it on you know, samples uh, that are coming from some distribution, it's not going to change as much. Right, so it will have low variance, but it will have high bias because it's not flexible enough. On the other hand, if I built a very complicated function, uh, it, it will have high variance because the data set that you see today, you might fit one function. If a slightly different data set might give you a different function. But if you average over these data sets, you will get the right function. So it's always the, the bias variance trade off. Uh, so um, uh, again, a linear system would have low bias. But uh, sorry, we'll have low variance but high bias, and very complex systems will have high variance but low bias. And this, you know, the the best function is somewhere in the middle, all right? That trades off these two. Um, and then there's a little bit of a hypothesis. Maybe we're just overfitting. Like these, we can always build these models with millions of parameters that can overfit. And the question is, maybe there is a better regularization that uh, that that uh, we can do. Um, so. For the first hypothesis for the un underfitting, there's a lot of work on better optimization. Obviously, we want to, we want to, we want to be able to build better optimization tools. Um, and I'll say a few words about some of them. Uh, there is an interesting algorithm called batch normalization, which is, has become kind of a standard to use in practice. Um, but it doesn't really have any theory behind it. It seems like a hack, but a hack that works surprisingly well. Um, there are some second-order approximation methods, such as KFAC, uh, that essentially trying to approximate uh, the, uh, the inverse of the fission information matrix. And then there is tons of work, but this is more of engineering work, you know, how to parallelize across GPUs, you do distributed computing, and that's what the companies like to do. Um, the second hypothesis is, you know, maybe we can use better regularization if it's overfitting. Perhaps we can use uh, dropouts, there's a stochastic dropout uh, um, uh, training that I'm going to talk about. There is unsupervised pre-training, which kind of allows you to perhaps initialize your parameters more reasonably. And it turns out that for a lot of these problems, you kind of have to use both. And the reason why uh, is the best performing systems today uh, are the systems where you're basically building a very large model and you regularize. So you always work in the over-parameterized regime. So you're always building models with millions of parameters, and then you try to regularize it. Um, so that's kind of um, um, what people are doing right now. But let me show you a couple of things, a few things from, from, from this perspective. Unsupervised pre-training. This is something, and during the second uh, half of the tutorial, I'm going to uh, show you why this became very important. I think that unsupervised pre-training basically started the whole field of deep learning with Jeff Hinton back in 2000. Six publishing the first paper shows how you can do pre-training of these systems. And it's actually quite interesting because it's probably a little bit forgotten, but there is a very nice theoretical justification for this unsupervised pre-training. Um, so it wasn't really, it was never really a hack. There is kind of, Jeff was able to show that there is something called variational low bound, and as you do unsupervised pre-training, you're improving the variational uh, bound, which kind of uh, attracted a lot of people to say, oh, there is something there, because you're actually optimizing some objective function. It's not just a hack where you do a bunch of things, and you find some good features, and you say, OK, that's good. Um, 
So on top of respect training, well, what you want to do is uh, one, one way of doing it would be to initialize hidden layers using on top of respect training, right? So you're basically forcing your model to represent latent structure in input distribution. Right? And you know, you're basically trying to say, I want my model to understand why this is a character and this is not. Right? Effectively by modeling the distribution over these pixels. So, um, and it's a harder task than a supervised learning task, right? Being able to build a model that can generate these characters, understand the precise position of all these pixels, is a much harder task than a classification task. Right? Uh, even from information theoretic standpoint, um, um, if, if you're trying to model all of these pixels, uh, that's a lot of information to model, right? as opposed to just saying, is it a two or not a two? Uh, so you'd expect less of a fitting. And uh, just a little bit of a preview, there is a class of algorithms called autoencoders, uh, which you can think of as a feed-forward neural networks uh, that essentially try to reproduce, given an input, reproduce the output. Um, and there is a very nice uh, connection if your hidden representation is actually linear and the output uh, is um, uh, linear as well, then you're pretty much recovering PCA. Uh, so there is an encoder, you encode your features, there is a decoder, you're trying to reconstruct the input. And obviously, you have to put some constraints by saying that this bottleneck layer perhaps should be smaller, or you put additional regularization constraints just to ensure that it doesn't learn identity. Um, uh, and then, typically, you know, if you for binary inputs using cross entropy, if for uh, real value um, inputs you're using L so, L two. Uh, you are using uh, you are you are telling us about total encoders in connection to a supervised pre training. A supervised pre training. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's exactly right. So, how does pre training work? You train one layer at a time with this unsupervised criteria. So you're just trying to reproduce the inputs that are going through some bottleneck. And, and then you fix the parameters of the previous layer. You go to the next layer, you do pre-training as well, right? So you kind of, you're learning uh, a little autoencoder here. You take the representations learned by the autoencoder. You do another autoencoder, and you're just stacking things together, right? Obviously, there are issues here, which is to say what stops you from learning the identity function. I just put the identity function, then it's, it's useless. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll say a few uh, later on during, uh, uh, during the tutorial, I'll, I'll show you some of, some of the tricks behind uh, what, what people are doing here. But the idea for the autoencoder at least is to try to reconstruct the input, so to try to force these parameters to say, well, whatever these parameters are, make sure that whatever they are, they're able to reconstruct back the inputs. So they're trying to encode some kind of structure in the input space. Um, and then uh, once you pre-train these overall layers, you typically add an additional output layer, which is a classification layer, and then you train the whole network in, in supervised fashion, right? So it's almost like you're initializing your parameters to understand what the input distribution looks like, and then you're trying to classify what, uh, what that is. I'm surprised in your figures, I don't see a, a bottleneck. Yes, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. There are, uh, um, uh, bottleneck is one way of enforcing it. Yeah. Sparsity is another way of enforcing yeah. it, and so forth. So there's a bunch of different regularization that I'll, I'll talk about uh, later, later in the tutorial. This is just an intuition of saying that what's what people were thinking about when, when doing pre-training. So uh, what is your constraint exactly? Like what you're saying that I want to have x hash, the input is x, <laughs> but I don't want x hat to be exactly x. So what do you want it to be? Oh, oh so, so uh, if, I, if I go back here, uh, let's say over here, what I want ultimately is I want x hat to be exactly x, right? But let's say if my x has 1,000 dimension and my hidden space, let's say, have 10 dimensions, then you, you know, unless you can have a perfect compression your data into 10 dimensional space, there's always going to be an error. But at the same time, you're sort of forcing these constraints by saying that find me parameters in such a way that I can at least encode some structure uh, in the data. But I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, later on, I'll talk about the autoencoder. Just think of these models as a way of forcing your parameters to encode something about the input distribution. Uh, yes? So, so you just said you're forcing your parameters to encode something about the input distribution. Is it possible to use these to sample from the input distribution? Yes, like uh, later on, yeah. so, so, so later on, I'll, I'll, I'll say a lot more about uh, these models. So, 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 so definitely. So, uh, yes. What was the reason for training one layer at a time? The reason why originally, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk uh, later precisely what these models are and how we're training these models. 
but the original reason was that it's just easier to train. It's an easy optimization problem because you only have one hidden layer. So when you use stochastic gradient descent and such, you, you tend to, it's just an easy optimization problem to solve. Uh, but let me, let me quickly um, um, sort of, uh, so that's, that's one piece. I guess there was one more question. Maybe I can take one more question. Uh, uh, yes. Right, so this is unsupervised pre-training, basically. You're just trying to reconstruct back the input, or you're trying to model uh, the distribution over the input space. Uh, so there's no particular signal, right? Where these methods will fail, you know, uh, if, if I go back here, is that, you know, if the whole supervised task that I'm trying to solve is to say, is this pixel black, then it's class one. If this pixel is white, then it's class zero. Then this whole procedure is gonna be useless. That's kind of the intuition, is that whatever the data is, whatever the distribution over the input space is, somehow it's useful for you to solve your task later, your supervised learning task, and this is a good thing to do. But I'll, I'm gonna say it uh, a little bit more precise uh, later on. This is just a little bit of motivation what, what people have done. The other class of algorithms um, is a stochastic dropout, uh, which is um, an interesting class uh, of training models, and it's quite, I guess one of the interesting pieces about stochastic dropout is that it's very easy to implement. And it turns out in our community, if you introduce something that's very easy to implement, people will use it. If it's super hard, it's just people, people don't use it. So let me show you the key idea behind uh, the dropout. What you're effectively trying to do is you're trying to cripple the neural network by removing some hidden units stochastically. Uh, right. So each hidden unit, um, is set to zero with probability 0.5. That's a basic algorithm. And you might ask, why 0.5? In forward propagation. In forward propagation, right. So you, you go in, you activate these units, you flip the coin, probability 0.5, you kill half of the units. Right. And it works actually quite well. And the reason, you know, a few people are asking why the reason 0.5, the answer is if you choose a number between zero and, zero and one, what would you choose? <laughs> Um, and, and reviewers would have less questions. You know, if we said, we're dropping things with probability 0.3.6 uh, or 0.37, then there's always a question, why 3.7, right? So it's always 0.5. It actually works reasonably well. Uh, but that's another hyperparameter. People are exploring. Sometimes you can use 0 0.2, 0 0.3, so it can have an impact. Um, and what the idea here is that hidden units cannot co-adapt to other units, right? And that seems to be a very good regularizer. In generally, in, in these systems, you say, well, if I'm detecting this feature and I'm detecting this feature, both of these features, if, if, if they co-adapt, they can predict the class, right? And this is the source of overfitting. What this is saying, this is saying is that one of them can disappear, so you still have to predict the correct class. So it turns out, it, it's actually people have done a little bit of studies, but it turns out that these units tend to be a little bit more independent uh, or uncorrelated. Um, now, um, and so hidden units must be a little bit more general. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, you could use a different dropout, but 0.5 typically works, uh, works well. Again, it's a hyperparameter that you have to choose. So you do this before training? Uh, no, you do it during training. So let me show you what the training. So the forward propagation pass, you always flip, uh, you always kill these uh, units with probability 0.5. Uh, right, so half of the network is always killed. So at, for every single example, you do it for every single training example. So it's interesting, if you actually pre-specify the masks for every single training example, you'll start seeing overfitting. So it is important to make sure that for every single training example, the choice of the architecture is random. So it's for every, not only for mini for every single, for every single example. Right. I, I think in the theory world it's called a noisy circuit. It's a classic von Neumann. Yes, that's right. That's right, it's a noisy circuit. Um, and if you look at the back propagation algorithm, if you look at how you're training these systems, the only changes, if you know, this is implementation of the back propagation algorithm, um, uh, sorry, this is implementation of the feed forward algorithm, the only thing that you need to do is you need to just add this, add this one piece, which is the masking to say which units are one, which units are zero, all right? And in the code, when you do back propagation, you just have the entire code the same way, and you're just multiplying it by these uh, M's. So it really just requires a change of one line in the code to do this. Uh, yes? At, at test time, do you also have to apply? Sorry. No, yeah, I'll, I'll get to the test time. Uh, so this is what you do during training time. 
Um, now, at test time, you basically replace the masks by their expectations. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's basically saying that um, this is simply a constant vector of 0.5 in probability. Yeah, so you're basically saying, you know, if, if I go back here just intuitively, half of the units here on average are zero, the total input to every single unit here is going to be half of what's, what's below. So at test time, you're using all the features, but you're replacing these with expectations, which basically means you're multiplying these weights by one half. So you're taking all of these units, and the total input to this unit gets multiplied by one half. So that on average, it's the same. So the, again, this is just an approximation. Um, uh, but at least at test time, there is no stochasticity. Uh, Maybe, yes. But the natural thing would be to take the expected output after the fund is in training. Sure. The issue with that is that it's expensive. You could do it. People have done it. And that typically gives you a little better results, which is you stochastically sample, let's say, 1,000 forward passes, and then you average. That would be. The way to think uh, about this. Also, maybe because you're using ReLU, uh, it may not. This may not work for non-ReLU. Um, it would work for non-ReLU. Well, Relu but is but but the thing is, uh, it depends because sometimes you're also killing things that are positive. Yeah. yeah. So so it's it it it. it it does have a little bit of impact. I mean, people have studied trying to figure out, you know, does it give better results? On average, not much. So it's not like you have a huge gain by, by doing proper uh, uh, expectation. And then what the, the way to think about these models, there is one view of these models, which you can think of it as a geometric average of exponential number of networks. Uh, right? Because if you think about it, for every single example, there is a different network. Right? And then exponential number of that. Because you're dropping, you know, if you have 1,000 units, then there are 2 to the 1,000 possible networks. Uh, and so, uh, but with those 2 to the 1,000 possible networks, they have the same parameters. So we kind of, it's almost, you know, intuitively, it's almost like you're training these exponential number of networks. They have the same parameters. And you're kind sort of shrinking them uh, uh, to have the same parameters. Um, and uh, obviously, there is also a nice uh, connection here. I think there were a few papers shown, uh, showing that in a linear case, in a, in a, if, if you only have the input and the output, in the linear regression case, if you're dropping out inputs, it becomes an expectation equivalent to L2 regularization. Right? So at least in a simple case, it shows you that it's doing something. In a nonlinear case, unfortunately, because expectations don't, you can't, get, you can't push expectation inside the sigmoid, then it becomes an approximation. That procedure, um, but this has become one of the kind of to-do things if you're training these models. Um, the other thing that ha has come up, uh, uh, so 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 to point this piece, there is a lot of papers written trying to understand what this thing is doing. There are a few papers showing that there is some connection to Bayesian approximation, trying to approximate the posterior. It's a geometric average. A few people have studied, but I don't think there is a definite answer what what the system is doing. Because at the end, you're just doing an approximation. Um, and in fact, there have been a few papers showing that if you have these complicated uh, multilayer neural networks, anytime you inject noise, you tend to do better. So somehow you perturb the system, and you're still asking it to solve the task, and it just becomes more robust. So there's the robustness arguments that people are trying to do. And I guess there isn't good theory, because these are non nonlinear systems that are local optimum. Uh, but anytime you inject noise, so some people sometimes inject Gaussian noise to the, uh, to the, to the activations of, of the hidden uh, uh, neurons. That tends to help as well. Uh, yes. Is injecting noise better than dropout? Not, not so far, not as far as I know. But if you, you know, if you take the total input to a particular neuron and you just add noise, some Gaussian noise, you know, that, and then obviously if, if you're right on the boundary, you add noise, you can shut it down if you're working in the ReLU, right? So things that are on the boundary with noise, so you basically, by injecting noise, you're basically forcing the system to say, either be sure that it's, uh, you know, it has high value, so detecting feature, or if you're uncertain, just shut it down. Um, but it tends, to, um, it tends to help. There's a few papers showing that, but, but again, there isn't, there, isn't, there isn't a lot of good theory behind why this is helping. So the goal uh, of this technique is to reduce overfitting, or like the consequence of this technique. That's right. The consequence of this technique is to reduce overfitting. So the intuition would be that since you learn a robust representation of the input, 
you sort of reduce in the search space because there are much fewer robust circuits than general circuits? Probably, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I think that one of the things, you know, from if, if I think about the practical standpoint, what people are doing is that if you have a data set that you're trying to solve, you know, you've seen these ImageNet data sets that people are competing on. The best way to solve the problem the, from a practical standpoint, again, is, is you build a very big system. If you remove any of these regularization, like dropouts uh, or L2, you basically want to make sure that you hit zero training error. Um, because if you don't, then you're somehow not using the capacity of the model. Right? So a lot of times people would basically say, I get 0% on uh, zero training error. So that means that my model is capable to, to at least uh, memorize all the training examples. And then you apply these techniques. Um, right? So it's almost you have all, all a prioritized system and you're regularizing it, as opposed to having a small system and trying to expand it. Um, so it seems that working and doing optimization over parameterized space and regularizing it is, is an easier task. Or perhaps it's an easier optimization task. Um, yeah. If you think about the ImageNet, it has 1.2 million images. The systems, uh, they have 50 million parameters. Some of some yeah, 100 million can parameters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. can yeah. hit the zero. There's a paper out which is even yes. by, with some theory coordinates, yeah. So you can hit you can hit zero training. You you need to hit zero training error, uh, and then you start regularizing these systems. So you kind of. Um, so this is how people use. This is how people train use. Them. That's First, right. hit zero and then. That's right. It's actually a very good test for even for your optimization, right? Because if you have overparameterized system, you don't hit zero training error. <coughs> maybe you have a wrong optimization. I mean, maybe you have a bug in your optimization. Uh, um, so. The other, the, other, the other point that I want to point out is there's a beautiful technique called batch uh, normalization that came out, out of Google about a year and a half, and it has become kind of uh, a standard uh, uh, thing to use as well. So one of the things that you'd, lo you'd want to do, maybe you'd want to normalize the inputs to speed up training, right? So for example, um, um, you, could no you, you, you could normalize perhaps um, at the level of the hidden layers. You can somehow normalize uh, the, the the hidden units, and I think that Jan Lacoon back in 98, the way is showing that if you normalize the input so that they, 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 they have some uh, reasonable, at least initialization, it could help. And batch normalization is an attempt to try to normalize the activation of the hidden variables. Um, so what you do is you do the following. Each unit's pre-activation is normalized. So you take the total input to the unit, and before, um, uh, before you pass it through nonlinearity, you subtract the mean, and divide by standard deviation. Uh, and I'm going to show you precisely what, what that means. So during training, the mean and standard deviation is computed for each mini batch. So you have, let's say you have 100 examples, 200 examples. For every single unit, you compute the mean and standard deviation, and you normalize by that. Uh, and then back propagation takes into account this normalization. And at test time, you're just using global mean and standard deviation, so averaged across all the training examples. Uh, what this does is it basically ensures that, on average, the input to each hidden unit is always roughly normal 0, 1. So and that doesn't cause saturation into the uh, hidden units. So this is the algorithm. Um, so for a particular mini batch, you compute the mean, you compute the variance, and then pre-activation of a hidden uh, uh, neuron, you subtract the mean, you divide it by variance. And then there's this sort of parameter just to make sure that you don't hit overflow problems, I guess. Is this improving the uh, vanishing gradient problem? This is greatly improving vanishing gradient problem. In fact, this is something that's, and, and now uh, these, um, uh, and then you basically say, well, the output of this whole system, so you take is an input, you normalize it, and the output, you have these two additional parameters. So for every single neuron, you have two additional parameters, alpha and beta. So typically, uh, sorry, uh, gamma and beta. So gamma is typically set to one, beta is typically set to zero. But in principle, what this thing is doing, it could undo the normalization, right, in principle. If, if your gamma is, you know, the variance or standard deviation and your beta is the mean, you could undo the transformation. Um, but this, this is, and now there is sort of questions of the form, what is this doing? Um, there have been a few papers showing that it sort of approximates diagonal elements of the Hessian, so it gives better, uh, but not quite. Uh, so right now, in, from, you know, from theoretical standpoint, it's just a hack. Uh, 
it's not clear what exactly it's, it's uh, is it sort of second order approximation method, is just approximation to the second order approximation method, not clear, right? Because you're computing these quantities based on a batch. So if you have one set of examples, it's one, one set of numbers. For different set of examples, it's a different set of numbers. How uh, thick are these batches generally? So these are typically 256, 128, 256, 512, so they go in the powers of two. A lot of it is also depends on your GPU. Uh, right, how much you can push on GPU and sort of to make the computations go faster. But that's actually a very good, uh, interesting um, uh, idea is to say how do you normalize the hidden variables so you don't hit these problems of, of saturated gradients. Um, and um, in, in principle, you, you, know, you, can, you can keep the preactivations to a non saturated regime, but linear transformation could in practice undo that if, if it wants to because you're taking gradient descent with respect to these parameters gamma and beta. You also, interestingly, when you do backpropagation, you backpropagate through this operation as well. So it's, it's almost like an additional layer that normalizes and then it's a, it's a, uh, the output. So you backpropagate through, the, um, through these operations as well. Um, and then at the test time, you're just using global mean and standard deviation. So you just have a single set of numbers for test case, just like in dropouts. Um, gamma and beta are different for each layer? Yes, for each neuron. For each neuron. So okay. for each unit, you have gamma and beta that you're learning, which is okay. I mean, generally, you, let's say you have 5,000 um, uh, units. So if you introduce 2,000 more parameters, it's not a big deal. Okay. Typically, the connections is what kills you between the layers, because if 1,000 and 1,000, then it, you have 10 million parameters that you're feeding. Do they change for another batch? Yes, that changes. Oh, no, these gammas, the, these parameters are hyperparameters you're learning. But this normalization will change for a different batch. So perhaps there is a better explanation as to what, what uh, people have, people did show that under certain conditions, it looks like what this is doing, it's approximating uh, diagonal of, of the Hessian. All right, so it kind of gives you somewhat of a second order approximation. Um, but not quite, because this normalization is data dependent. For a given data that you see, you normalize differently. And that actually is quite important. I know whether people explored other ways of doing it, but it's, it's kind of, um, you know, when you look at this, you basically say it's a one big hack, but it's a hack that works remarkably well. It's kind of one of the things that people are just using. So perhaps there is something there. And uh, the last point that I want to make before we go to the break is that stochastic gradient descent with momentum and batch normalization and dropout usually works really well. It's super hard to beat this um, in, in, in general. Um, and then there are kind of these, <laughs> these interesting things. This is sort of recommendations coming from uh, Mark Aurelio, who's, uh, who's at Facebook. You know, you pick the loading rates, you run the subset of the data, you sort of adjust the loading rates. So there's a lot of different tuning are things that you have to do. You initialize, you use rail and you know, and yet, just you want to initialize it properly so you don't hit these uh, bad uh, initialization or things in saturation. And visualization is actually quite important because you know, if you're training these models, let's say you're looking at the hidden units, you're looking at the samples, a number of examples, if you look at the activation of hidden units, that typically looks good, uh, right? So for example, you know, they are um, independent of each other, so the model is doing something. So typically, you know, this would be good, and then if you're learning something like this, this is bad, or if you're learning something like this, this is bad. This is essentially saying that there is one hidden unit that's pretty much not doing anything across all samples, or there are these hidden units that are basically replications of each other. So they both do the same thing. So generally, these are heuristics that people are looking when training these models to say, is it doing something reasonable? Precisely because it's a, it's a, it's a non-convex optimization problem. So it's uh, yes. If there's a set of hidden units that aren't doing anything, don't you lose all information of the data at that point? Um, it's, sometimes it happens. You know, like sometimes you initialize it, and uh, or you initialize biases in the wrong way. So you basically say just shut down this unit, and that's it. It just doesn't learn anything. These are dead units. So sometimes units just on all the time. Again, because the biases are not quite right, so it's just always one all the time, and so it's. Uh, these are useless, basically, they, they, don't, they don't do anything. Um, but, um, right, so let me, uh, I guess let me stop here because I think there is a break, so I just want to make sure that you get coffee. Um, uh, there is a question, uh, I guess, maybe you can ask it. Go back one slide, I just want to 
what do these mean exactly? So these are, uh, I guess I should point out that this is for, particularly for computer vision applications. Um, so for example, these are the visualization of the hidden variables. You know, if you, if you take a hidden unit and you look at the input and you just visualize uh, uh, what that looks like, if you're training, in, in this case it was trained on images. If you're finding the patterns where you know, there is edges, and I'll, I'll say a few more about that as we go through the tutorial, then it generally is okay. Well, if, you're seeing, if you're seeing something like this, you know, these are basically, the two units are doing the same thing. These are doing the same thing. What exactly are these pictures showing? Can you, can you understand? Yeah, let me, uh, you know what, let me just go back here quickly and show you what they're showing. What these pictures are showing is that for every input, you have this input. If you think of this input as an image, right? Uh, let's say this input is 28 by 28 image. So 784 of these inputs. And what I'm showing you is I'm showing you just a visualization, a 28 by 28 visualization of these weights. So these weights, you can think of them as later on when I talk about some of the applications in vision, uh, these weights are effectively edges. The, the different, the different, pixels in this image have different weights. Different weights. Different pixels in this image, that's right, are different weights over here. So if you see little edges, what it's effectively doing is it's basically saying if that edge is present in the image, that particular unit will have very high activation. We'll say that that edge is present. And if it's more or less random, or uh, it's like you have these bars that are not really doing anything, then it's telling you the model is not really doing anything here. But in some sense, it's a picture of the dual space. It's, it's uh, the picture of the weights. That's right. The of the weights. Of weights and lots of space of the of the pixels. Pixels. That's right. Yeah. So let me let me stop here uh, and um, uh, continue after after the break.